We're on episode 13 of the 52 Weeks of Reefing. This one was called Ammonia. Not as simple as you think. The ideal tank cycle. And our core belief here. <laughs> core belief on ammonia is it matters. Then it doesn't, except when it does. <laughs> uh, you know, ammonia is such a goofy thing here. There's like a couple of different pieces. Like it does matter in the beginning, uh -huh. right? Uh, you have, especially if you're using live rock, a lot of organics on it. It's going spike. to spike. Yeah. Uh, Toxic to fish. And then if you bought an ammonia test kit, you'll probably never use it again. Yep. And Once you'll your never cycle, think about well, it again. Except for like, there are a couple of reasons when, you know, you might see ammonia be a problem in your tank. Mm. One might be uh, I have chloramines in my water and I'm dosing ammonia gas to uh, my freshly mixed salt water or my auto top off water. Mm. Ammonia in that case really matters. Yeah. Uh, it might also be why a lot of people don't use canister filters and sand filters and things like that. Because in those cases, like with live rock, you know, the power edge goes out or whatever. Nobody cares. Yeah. Like you turn it back on, all the ammonia and the filtration in your tank still lives. Mm -hmm. With uh, something like a, a bio ball or, you know, like a bio balls, if the power goes out, well, the trickle stops, the plastic dries out, and your entire filter is done, right? Yeah. But all the organics in the tank have not stopped producing ammonia, and so when the power comes back on, everything dies. It breaks down. Yeah, and dies. Same thing with the sand. When the, sta the sand filters stop uh, tumbling, well, all of a sudden, uh, you get a lack of oxygen, everything dies, and it doesn't work again. Same thing with like canister filters, same mm -hmm. with all these things. There's some things like those uh, ceramic medias that tend to stay moist for a long time that are less of an issue, but uh, in general, it matters that it doesn't, except for when it does. So what do we believe matters most? <laughs> First one we believe matters most about ammonia is that live rock is better than a filter because Rock doesn't break. So that's exactly what that, I just said. That's that canister filter analogy, everything. It doesn't break. You can't really break a live rock filter. Yeah. In fact, when I first. I mean, you'd have to drain, the tank would have to be drained, dried for a long period of time, then refilled back up and started all over again. Well, that just doesn't happen. When a, like you'd a have power to, like, outage. Pour bleach in the tank. <laughs> uh, actually, when I first asked, uh, uh, there's a, a, a fish uh, store, local fish store here called Sea Level. And I went in there and that was the first place I ever asked about a fish uh, saltwater tank. And they said, you know what? Often salt water is actually easier than fresh water mm. because there is the filters. There isn't any filter here. Yeah. You don't have an under gravel filter, you don't have any of that stuff. The rock actually filters the tank for you. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I would have never thought that it was easier. Yeah. Uh, and for fish only. He might be right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, okay, so what matters most? Uh, cycle is more about live rock than dry rock. Ah, this is that uh, biome conversation that we're starting to explore a little more too. Is uh, you, know, you know, when is your cycle complete? Is the ultimate question. And I think a hundred, hundred different ways or hundred ways from Sunday, everybody would ask uh, answer when there's no more ammonia mm -hmm. and there's no registered nitrates. And I think the inverse too is also true, which is that live rock comes with so much more organics that you're going to have a bigger ammonia spike and the dry rock has no organics on it. So you won't have the ammonia spike. And the only ammonia spike with that case would come from whatever fish you put in there and tiny amount of food, which is probably minuscule in comp comparison to all mm -hmm. the organics that come on live rock. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the nitrogen cycle in ammonia is a lot more important to pay attention to with live rock than dry because of that. That'll be interesting to test. Mm -hmm. um, it's plausible. Uh, all right. What also we believe matters most is bacteria in a bottle almost certainly works, but some better than others. Now we started this test, uh, got some results, and then uh, kind of threw it in the trash. You know, we were testing different bacterial supplements, different cycling methods and approaches. I haven't looked at the data myself yet to see what came of it, but that's the uh, one where they was... all didn't have any because we used dry rock, yeah, and they didn't have any ammonia spike. Yeah. Even yeah. the sample one, even with eight fish in it, yeah. right? And even using the Hawk, like a three thousand dollar machine plus hobby test kits, couldn't Not find it. Tested. It was, that was the, like the surprise, yeah. you know? And so if we used live rock, we'd probably have a different result. Mm. Uh, but bacteria in a bottle almost certainly works. The, the difference though is 
you know, storage, does the bacteria like have a problem with heat? Does it have a problem with freezing? And some, some of the bacteria in those bottles don't replicate in salt water. So you kind of get like a one time dose of it. Uh, some have heterotrophic bacteria in there that do something else. And, you know, the problem with it, too, is like even if you got it like your fish store, you're like, mm -hmm. oh, well, I didn't get it frozen like I did if I you know bought it from bulk resupply in February. Uh, <laughs> you know. But it still crossed the nation in February mm -hmm. uh, and landed somewhere. It just got thawed when you bought it off the shelf because it had to get there somehow. Yeah. Right. And actually, <laughs> in many cases, hot is just as bad or even worse than freezing. Uh, mm -hmm. And so if it's on the back of a truck and it's a 180 degree or 130 degrees inside the back of the semi, you know, baking in the sun for that whole trip. Well, yeah, it, it may have some problems as well. So, you know, a lot of these things, when you look at the different ones, think about, you know, where you got it from, did it go, did it get too cold? Did it get too hot? It, do they specifically say on the bottle that, you know, heat or uh, cold don't matter? And if you had to buy it in a fridge, that it was temperature controlled at the store to mm. uh, maintain the quality, the chances that it was shipped in a refrigerated uh, truck to get there. Pretty low. I call near zero. Uh, just knowing what happens it, in our industry. It's not human food. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because nothing else in that shipment that came from that facility uh, also had to have that same level of care. So probably not. Yeah. It'd be interesting as we explore the biome conversation and we come up with maybe yeah, the, an idea of what a good or fully diverse biome looks like uh, and how that compares to what's in some of these actual bottles. I, I highly doubt that uh, you can get, you know, you can't get all, there's bacteria that travel well, there's bacteria that can be bottled well, there's bacteria that you can, uh, maybe you can't even culture and put in a bottle that uh, might benefit your, your cycle. Uh, so the future of the, the bacteria bottles and, and how you get them, how you source them, what's in them and stuff like that might might change. You know, I'll tell you, actually, there's some of them I just happen to know, uh, like uh, the bacteria in the bottle that come from KZ. I know what that one did because uh, that one shipped it here via air. Hmm. You know, so we should put that stuff on a plane from Germany and get it here. So I know the transport of that one. Uh, but a lot of them you just won't really know. OK, so what else uh, about uh, uh, what else do we believe matters most? Uh, next one here is can I buy you can, you can buy a test kit or you can just wait until nitrate starts to show up. So you can waste your 10 bucks or eight bucks or whatever tech uh, an ammonia test kit come uh, cost. Uh, you can waste another eight to ten dollars on a nitrite test kit or you can just buy the nitrate test kit that you're going to use anyway and uh, let your tank run until you start to measure something on there. Uh, I probably would never buy an ammonia test kit. Uh, I just give it some time. <laughs> I have experience tells me I could just wait some time. And if I starting to see nitrate or nitrate in my test kit, hmm. the cycle is probably. I don't know how many times I've tested for nitrite and never, never seen it. And the first tank like, I ever owned, I, I wanted to test every stage of the cycle. Yeah, like a lot of people totally you're told. Unnecessary. Yeah. And then that test kit just goes in the trash. It'll, it'll <laughs> expire by the time you need to use it again. Uh, okay, so another uh, thing that matters most is ammonia gas in your water supply is probably the number one concern about ammonia. No, after the fact, huh? after yeah. the cycle. Yeah. yeah, so after you cycle your tank, if you're worried about ammonia, it's probably the number one source will be 50% of you have chloramines in your water, which is chlorine mixed ammonia when you mm. split it up. If you do it, I have a like a poor carbon block, you'll end up with ammonia gas in your water. If it smells like ammonia, that means there's ammonia in the yeah. water for sure. Mm. And is there a way to solve for it? Uh, pro series. Those pro series resins. Yeah. And the right carbon blocks up front. Yeah. So that's, that's about it. All right. Uh, uh, you, we also believe that matters most is you don't, uh, don't more than double the fish inches in a week. Uh, he's, uh, the fish, you know, they breathe and when, or they respirate. And when they respirate, they produce ammonia. And uh, if you add a whole ton of fish at once, all of a sudden to your tank, uh, was the bacterial population or was the biome in the, in the tank ready to handle that influx of ammonia? Uh, probably not. It's a, not only that, but it's the food you're going to add yeah. too along with it. So 
Uh, yeah, I probably wouldn't double. And we said, you should say kind of double the amount of fish, but it's kind of inches, you know? So yeah, I mean, like, if I could put two big giant fish in there and uh, I'm just as screwed. <laughs> these are just rough guidelines. Uh, yeah. If somebody is asking me, uh, don't put 50 fish in all at once, yeah. you know, in an unestablished bank. <laughs> uh, uh, also, for, if you're going to buy a test kit, probably the little sea camel alarm is really little, popular. Little tiny wheel guy that uh, you can uh, suction cups inside and it tells you, hey, toxic, or uh, a uh, uh, Toxic amount of ammonia are not so bad. Yeah, uh, super I would probably easy. buy that before I buy a test kit because I don't want to perform the test kit. I can just walk up and see it. Yeah, uh, uh, visual indication. All right, uh, hard lessons from ammonia. <laughs> Uh, the first hard lessons that we learned about ammonia is that the Senai uh, wasn't useful. It wasn't that useful. Uh, the Senai has the ammonia monitoring built into it. You have the little, you know, 30-day tabs that you can stick in. Uh, and we actually built out uh, a testing apparatus or uh, that we got this big giant Senai hub. It had like a dozen or so Senais attached to it that we could, all of them uh, connected to the internet so we can monitor. And we, the thought process was is we would monitor, monitor ammonia in real time. Uh, so when we did these cycle tests in the 12 different tanks, you could actually like pull up some numbers and charts and see like the uh, process of ammonia throughout the day and throughout the extent of the test. Uh, you went and tried that at home and found out that that does not actually work. I don't know, something that didn't work. It just give, didn't give me the readings and the, the range that I wanted mm. in. And the little tabs expire every single month and I have to replace them. And I'm not the kind of person that replaces things on time yeah. like that. <laughs> uh, and the problem is, is like a pH probe, I know full well the value of the pH probe, what it's doing for me. Uh, and so I replace it, the little tab in there. I guess mm. it also monitors pH, but it's done in 30 days. I, I don't know, you know, I, I get that ammonia is monitoring. The only thing in the tank that will actually tell you stuff is dying because ammonia is happening. Yeah. But I don't think most people would use this tool that way. And they no, found I found that it was less than less than ideal <laughs> at actually doing it. So I don't know. That was just for me. Other people might feel differently. I mean, it does uh, water level sensor temperature and, you know, it has, uh, um, uh, par meter kind of built uh, built into it too so there's it's a useful tool in other aspects maybe just not this one all right uh, another hard lesson we already said was nitrite test kit worthless don't buy one stop, uh stop it'll them. just expire there's no need for it just measure <laughs> the nitrate when it starts showing up you're probably good yeah uh the other hard lesson i had on the 360 was the fishless cycle i decided for the first time to just do ghost dose ammonia mm. And, you know, you ghost dose ammonia to like one part per million, and it actually causes the cycle to take way longer than if you had just slowly built up the ammonia. Uh. The ammonia, like actually those uh, bacteria take a while to actually process all of that. And it does it slower when there's that much ammonia in there. Yeah, at uh, a steady rate. And then I, I forget the conversion, but I think one part per million ammonia turns into like four yeah. parts per million nitrate in the end. Somebody will correct me on that one, but it's more than one. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, wow, why would you want to start a tank this way? Yeah. I, I didn't get it. I, I, I don't know. I, there's got to be a, probably a better way. I, if I did it again, I wouldn't immediately bring it up to uh, one part per million. Mm. I would bring it up to like, I don't know a tenth of a part per million or even less and I would slowly dose it in the same, like essentially the same rate that throwing two fish or a little bit of food in there would do. But to be honest, uh, it's like dumping a year's supply of food uh, on your head at once. You're like, all right, let's see how long it takes you to get through this. I don't know, especially <laughs> with the dry rock thing, man, I just have never had a problem with losing fish uh, up front. Mm. So uh, I just, I would not do that. Yeah. I just buy the the or the bacteria booster and uh, call it a day. The fishless cycle just I don't lose fish that way, so I just wouldn't I wouldn't be concerned about it. I wouldn't do it. It hmm. wasn't worth it for me. Uh, that hits on the ammonia turns to nitrate as well. Uh, yeah, because a hard lesson learned is ammonia turns to nitrate. So and I mean it goes back to exactly what we said is uh, what we believe matters most. Uh, just buy a nitrate kit and wait for it to get there, but. Uh, actually, you know, oh, interesting is like that refugium and when you start the refugium, because uh, mm. uh, it's going to process uh, 
you know, it'll probably process ammonia first. It'll like seek out ammonia and, and sucking up ammonia before it gets to nitrate too. But uh, so does that mean you inhibit your cycle because you try to start your refugium first because it's now now that's taking the ammonia rather than bacteria and is it Might. still safe? I don't know. It's hard to say. Ah. Yeah. Another hard lesson is pH affects ammonia in a fish bag. Okay, so in the, the fish bag, when this you is, buy it. I, yeah, actually, I asked you, I was like, pH? You're like, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when you're in a, uh, when you buy a fish, especially online, and mm -hmm. then you get it delivered, it's been thrown around by FedEx for a day, and it's in here. It's usually water that has a, a chlorine or a, like a, a copper in it. Mm -hmm. and whatnot. But if you get ammonia in there, what happens is uh, the fish is breathing all this carbon dioxide into the bottle or into the bag. And there is ammonia building up in that bag. And uh, what happens is it's not toxic because at a low pH, the ammonia is actually ammonium. Interesting. Right. Uh, however, once you start doing your uh, like a uh, trickle, um, you know, open the bag, uh, acclimate, whatever, yeah. and you get gas in there, all of a sudden the pH rises, the ammonium turns into ammonia gas, which is super toxic, toxic to the fish and really bad for them. So uh, one of the things you can think about is like, you know, doing an accelerated uh, uh, acclimation, acclimation. Mm -hmm. like don't make it th take three hours because you <laughs> might actually be doing more harm than yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, like ask who you're getting this from. So like Elliot at Marine Collectors, I was talking to him about this and he's like, yeah, most of the places you buy online will ship it to you in water that came from the systems, which means it's filled with copper and stuff. And they can't put, in most cases, the ammonia like detoxifier in there because those things will become toxic together, oh, okay. right? And so in his case, what he does is he uses brand new fresh or salt water that doesn't have copper or any medications in it. And then he puts the ammonia detoxifier in the bag so that even when you start to do your acclimation, when you get it to your house and Still the pH rises up, it. the detoxifier yeah. will make sure the ammonia isn't uh, mm. having that problem. So that's like one of those things of getting healthy pets from somebody who actually takes care who of them. Who knows what they're than, doing? <laughs> yeah, rather than the cheapest possible source of pets. I don't pets. know, I wouldn't know that. <laughs> yeah, all right, so what's next?